Good afternoon. You're listening to Gambling with an Edge. Now here are your hosts, Bob Dancer and Richard Munchkin. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Richard Munchkin. And I'm Bob Dancer. And today our guest is Mr. Doppy. Mr. Doppy has been tirelessly doing the show notes for Gambling with an Edge for like five years now. Um, so we wanted on our farewell tour, we wanted to have him on because his life has kind of changed considerably due to gambling with an edge. And, uh, so we wanted to have him on to talk about that as, uh, a success story. So, uh, Mr. Doppy, welcome to gambling with an edge. Yes. Uh, Thank you, guys. It's certainly great to be here. I'm a longtime fan, and yeah, I mean, it's really had a great impact on my life, so I'm honored to be here. Thank you. So can you tell us basically how that started, how what the, how things changed for you when you started listening to Gambling with an Itch? Uh, sure, right? So I started listening, and I was doing very small amounts of advantage play. I was doing like a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, couponing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I was hustling a lot of Ultimate X in my local casino. And the, and basically, there were only about two other guys that were checking the machines all the time. And then there was a day that I saw one of those guys on a carnival game. And it just didn't make sense to me why he would be playing a carnival game when there were all these Ultimate X machines that he could have been checking that were all still good. And until I approached the game, and then I noticed why he was playing that carnival game. And that was something that I would not have known if not for Gambling with an Edge. I just would have thought he was playing on the square. And so then that kind of introduced me to that. And then I ultimately started talking to him, and I became friends with him. And then he introduced me to some other guys that were very, very sharp here in my hometown. And we've all become friends. And They've been really, really helpful to me, uh, both psychologically and also in terms of like information and getting sharper. And basically it all started because I saw that whole card game, which I would not even have known to look for if I hadn't been listening to Gambling with an Edge. What, what did you mean that, uh, helpful psychologically? Like I think when I started out, I had a very small bankroll and I was accustomed to not a lot of swings. And so as my bankroll grew, there were a lot of opportunities where, like, you have to take on some extra swings to take on more EV, right? And that, I think, was something that I was not accustomed to. And if I was trying to do that alone, I think it would have been hard to know if this is really the correct thing because we're all kind of biased by outcomes and trusting the process and also seeing people that are successful tell you that this is the right thing. Right. That was really, really important to me because otherwise I don't know that I could have taken some of the variance as well as I did, because just like in finance, like you have a bankroll, but like you have a psychological bankroll and you have a financial bankroll. And if you do a play, you have to meet both criteria. Right. And so I felt like yeah. early on as I was ramping up and starting to win more, but also starting to lose more at times, that was kind of challenging for me to deal with. And those guys were really thoughtful in helping me get the skills to kind of psychologically deal with that, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, no. You have to ramp up at your own speed, basically. You know, you have to, because I remember when, you know, going from red chips to green chips, the fur in the beginning was like, oh man, this is a lot of money. And then you get, you get used to it. And then you go up to black chips and it's like, oh man, uh, this is a lot of money, you know. So it just, yeah, everybody yeah. makes that progression at their own speed. Yes, that is true. But if I had to make that progression alone without a group of friends or a community, I think it would have been much slower. And some of the things that I did were very time sensitive. And so, you know, being able to ramp up faster, I think, was really valuable. Yeah. You mentioned uh, you did ultimate X vulturing, and then you learned a little bit about hole carding. Mm -hmm. What else did you do in your AP adventures? Sure, right. So, I mean, I think that prior to being, like, in the casino side, I was always looking for ARBs. So, like, I did a lot of scalping tickets and anything like that. And then once I got into the casino stuff, like I said, it was 
it was all of the it was all of the couponing. I did the slot hustling for years, but now that's very competitive where I live, so I kind of gave that up. And then I had a tip once about a lottery play um, that was beatable, and so I did that at a very small scale for a couple of months kind of solo, you know, just doing it by myself because it wasn't really expensive to do it. And then they changed the stakes on it and it became a lot more expensive, which, but, but it was the same game. And so it became a lot more valuable. And uh, so I said, I said, uh, so I said uh, to my girlfriend at the time, I said, I need all of the money that we have to like spend on lottery <laughs> tickets. Like I need every dollar that we have. <laughs> And so not the one uh, wives and girlfriends just love that one. <laughs> well, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I think it was more surprising when we told people that's what happened. You know, they all kind of felt like you did, Richard. They were like, why on earth would she agree to this? But right. I think that she had right. kind of known that that day might come. You know, I think at the back of her mind, she had kind of seen me do some other things and was like, you know, there might be a situation when this is going to happen. And so I told her, I said, this is the situation. And so I need all the money that we have. And and, uh, and how much are we talking here? I think at that point, our liquid savings, which is all that we could get access to in a week was like 40 K. Uh -huh. And so <laughs> at the, and so at the end of that week, I had $84 that were not in tickets. <laughs> Oh, man. And she, um, she was down with this. Well, she was down with this because I had done it on a smaller scale prior. It was the same situation, but now it was just with the stakes were higher, right? So I said, look, I have proof of concept that this is going to work, and the return on this is excellent, and this is, like, kind of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Now, there were lots of other, like, you know, small nuances that we can talk about or not. But, but, but because I had experience doing it prior, I felt like it's the same game, you know, it's just more money. So why wouldn't you try to ramp it up? So you, you bought $40,000 worth of lottery tickets. What did you think your EV was? And then what was the result? So that is a unique uh, situation. So I would just say that like the EV is above a carnival game by a good bit if you have a whole card information. So, you know, it's like, okay. well, it's strong. That depends on which carnival game it is, but well, yeah, okay. so, uh, I mean, by a lot. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I mean, it's not Mississippi stud, you know, but it, it's, it's like, a, it, it's a little over 30%. Um, wow. So, uh, and they picked a game that was not very swingy, which was the mistake, I think, right? So it's not a very swingy game. And the edge is over 30%. And so I had always made money. I made money every time I did it, 100% of the time. And the first week that we did it together, we didn't really make much money at all. In fact, I think that she finished slightly down. And wow. so that would be like about a 10 standard deviation event. And so something's wrong, right? We just have to figure out what's right. wrong. Right, <laughs> right. Um, and so w what was wrong was there was a software situation on certain types of buys where you would not get the tickets that you were owed. And, wow. and so the, that situation, my opinion is that they're aware that that exists because on the newer software, it doesn't exist, but on the old software, it still does It's not been updated. And I wow. talked to one of the clerks at a store where I was buying tickets, and he explained it to me. And he said, oh, no, 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 here's the problem, and here's how you fix it. So then I was able to fix it. And, you know, I feel bad for some guy somewhere who probably saw this and, <laughs> and thought that he could also go and just print money and then didn't realize that the software was off, you know, and probably thought the game was rigged. But yeah, wow. I had a very, very, I had a very, very thoughtful store owner. And part of the other thing that I would add is that that was important was like from finding the right store to buy the tickets at. Because what I was afraid of 
is that someone could just do this. If someone knew what I was doing and they had access to capital, they could also do it. But I, right. but what I also couldn't do is go to a store where the guy behind the counter was like a 16-year-old kid that was like, I'm not doing this for hours and hours and hours. I want to sit here on my phone. And so right. I think the solution was like finding stores that are not crowded, that are not going to be busy because you need lots of volume. And then finding stores where the owner is the cashier because they're making a commission on every ticket. And a store where the owner right. is also not going to trust the math. He's just going to think that you're a lunatic and he's going to be very <laughs> <laughs> And so. so. So you didn't try to spread it out. You put all the money through one store. Uh, well, no, because I had a store and my girlfriend had a store. Oh, okay. um, but. But I, but I thought that it was important that we buy the tickets in person because I believe that there are rules about buying tickets r remotely or dropping off cash or something. So I made sure that we read every rule and with the situation, I have every copy in which it was advertised. You know, I have hard copies of their own posters and I took pictures of billboards and I made sure that I you know, really, really followed the fine print to the T because I didn't want any problems. Um, and so part right. of that was making sure that I was there buying them in person and buying them like a normal customer would. Now, I can say, you know, as someone who has always stuttered and who got picked on a lot, it was a very interesting feeling to be in a convenience store for hours buying infinite amounts of lottery tickets. <laughs> <laughs> and constantly getting made fun of and just really not caring <laughs> because I knew, you know, kind of what the answer was here. I, I knew who the sharpest guy, at least in that store, was. And that was yeah. an interesting so feeling what happened, right, for me to have that confidence. Yeah, yeah. What happened week two? So in week two, we figured out the problem with the software and – then just right on EV, enormous sample, exactly where it should be. I mean, there are a couple hiccups. We, like, we would print so many tickets that the blades would get hot. And when the blades would get hot, <laughs> they would get too soft to cut the tickets. So some days I would come home with a roll, you know, of like 500 yards long of uncut tickets. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, but I would say, like, in general, that, you know, the, then it worked perfectly. As, as soon as the software problem was solved, it worked perfectly. And yeah, it was just about, you know, trying to like, trying then to get more cash for the following week, you know, because you need cash all the time. And I was running out of money. So I just it was, you know, working crazy days, just, you know, trying to turn it over. Oh, so because when you get paid this money back, it comes as a check or something? It technically, so I have all these tickets and I have to cash all the tickets. And so I can either turn the tickets into cash or I can turn the tickets into vouchers and buy more tickets with the voucher. And so at first I was just buying more tickets with the vouchers because that was the most efficient way to do it. But then at the end, you obviously like you need to get the cash out. And one of the grossest parts about these state sponsored lotteries is there's no cash out infrastructure. Because you don't ever right. take the money. You only buy more tickets. And so, like, I would go into a grocery store and I'd be like, I have a lot of vouchers. Can I have some cash? And they'd be like, yeah. Uh, right in something, I would say, no, I have a lot of vouchers. Like, how much cash can I have? And they'd say 500 or or $1,000, right? And I'm just like, that's not, en that's not enough. But, but there's no yeah. – but there's no infrastructure to get the money out, which is just, which just shows you how predatory those games are. Wow. So how long did this last, and how big did it get? Yeah, I mean, it lasted um, it lasted for a couple of months, and then that they were going to do it again. Unbelievably, they were going to do it again, and they were actually going to do it again in a way that had smaller tickets. And so smaller tickets would print faster, right? And so speed is everything. And so I was like, if they do that, and now I had some capital and I also had lots of vouchers. And I was thinking, if they do that, I, 
I mean, I still get chills thinking about it because, like, it would have been <laughs> so much money. And then they just – they pretended it never happened. They, they pulled everything. They just kind of shut it all down. Um, so it stopped after a couple months. Wow. So uh, so now you have this uh, newfound success and quite a bankroll by the end of this uh, lottery thing. Where Where did you go from here? Well – well, well, in fact, I thought I was done with that play, uh, but it turned out that I wasn't because the following year, uh, in the afternoon, I had some gentlemen stop by my house. I had a special agent from the U.S. Postal Service, and I had a special agent wow. from, the, from the Department of Homeland Security. Um, oh, good. Those are always fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? So that's a very special day in your life when those guys show up at your back door. Yeah, and so that was during the pandemic, and I was here with my girlfriend because she was off for the summer. And so she went to the back door, and she said, there are guys here to see you. And I said, okay. And I went to the back door. I got the badges and stuff in my face. And then I'm like, well, 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 I don't know what to do at this point because, like, I paid all my taxes. I did everything right. I know I did nothing wrong and nothing illegal. But I still might have to pay to defend myself. And so what should I do? And so I opened the door and they asked me what my name was. I told him my name. And then I said, I said, you guys are wearing masks and I'm not wearing a mask. And I'm assuming if we're going to talk, we're going to be talking for a while. So do you want me to get a mask? And I said, yes. Or was like, and, and then so they said yes. And I got a mask. And I was like, I guess I'll talk to them unless it gets really confrontational, in which case I'll just have to call an attorney. So I went back and he said, okay, now tell us wh why we're here. Um, and so I thought about that question for a couple seconds and I said, you know, I'm really happy to speak to you gentlemen, but that question is a little open-ended for my taste and I would prefer very specific questions. And then they yeah. said, no problem. We have lots and lots of specific questions for you. And I said, okay. And they said, so tell us how you know this one particular person and this other person. And I said, I know them because they work at a store that I buy a lot of lottery tickets at. And they said, okay, good. Now tell us why you do that. And I said, I do it because some people are bad at math. And they looked very <laughs> perplexed. Um, because as it turned out, they were investigating a case at that store. And so my activity there made it seem like I was involved in some kind of illegal activity or or possibly illegal activity, right? I don't know what happened with the case, but, but um, and so I basically then, I had some screenshots about the map and stuff. I had a Google Doc, so I tried to explain it to them as simply as I could. I mean, I know they're smart guys, but I was, you know, they're not AP. So I, I was just trying to say, look, like this is why a ticket is valuable. And this is the situation in which tickets are valuable. And if you know that they're valuable, then like you should buy as many as you possibly can. And they were pretty skeptical of that for about 40 minutes. But then when they would ask me questions, like, I always knew the answer to the question in a way that you would only know if you did it for the reasons that I did it, right? Like, you know, like, they would ask me right. about, the, about the size of my vouchers, and I would explain it. And they would ask me about my taxes, and I would explain it. And I said, I have boxes of every ticket I ever bought. Like, you want to see my tax return? You know, I, I paid a lot of tax on money that no one knew existed, and this is how I did it and this is why and I'm a finance guy right and so like I understand math and I and, and so basically about an hour into it I kind of got the sense that they were like he's probably not associating with people that would be doing a simple crime possibly right or like right yeah and, and well, then I, I think I, uh, they kind of softened up and then that was it yeah I I wanted to ask you about you. So every week you've got like a billion tickets, and now you have to sort through them to find the winners. How do you how do you do that? Uh, well, I mean, well, I mean, you can go to the store and you can scan them, and it takes a very long time. 
And some wow. tickets are worth a lot more than others. So you could kind of sort and get a sense of which tickets would be more valuable due to some factors that I probably don't want to discuss. And then you could figure it out. So, so that would help with the churn, right? It's not like I had just to check every single ticket every week, but I needed to check as many as I could. But, you know, th there is kind of a cap onto the amount of tickets that I could buy. But I would say in a given week between my girlfriend and I, I mean, we were probably working 17, 18 hour days only checking tickets or buying tickets. Uh, uh, oh, my God. Well, but it was worth it. <laughs> Well, well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, I think it was worth it. Although, I mean, I feel like if she was here, she'd probably shake her head and say it was worth it, but I don't want to do it again. Yeah, yeah. Did, you, did the relationship survive the end of the promotion? Uh, it did survive the end of the promotion, yes. And I think that her and her family, they kind of also, like, understood it. Like, right, because I had to kind of explain it to people. Like, this is what we're doing, and this is going to sound weird, but. You just have to trust me, like, this is going to be fine. Because I think that the biggest fear that her family had was that, like, was that, like, that she was going to get robbed. Because we're in the same stores all the time, right? With lots of money and lots of tickets. So yeah, I think that's, that there was a fear. that's a real concern, yeah. Yeah, right? Or if I'm going to the store then to catch the tickets, that's also a concern. Because, you know, I finally found a store sure. that had... A, a fair amount of cash they could give me every day, but then I'm there every day. And so every day I'm walking through the parking lot, you know, and like starting to worry. Now, how long ago was that? I mean, that was a couple of years ago for sure. So I think it's been, it's been three years since I had the federal agents at my house. And that was like a year or two after the promotion. So when that finally ended, you suddenly had time on your hands again. <laughs> which you didn't yeah. before you were doing 17 hour days with tickets. So uh, yeah. where did you go from there? Well, so from there, I was fortunate enough to be in a state that had uh, sports betting was legal and that that was in kind of the golden age of uh, sports betting where there were high customer acquisition costs. They weren't really caring. They just wanted market share. They wanted to get people involved in the app. And so you know, that is also an industry where a small percentage of the betters make up a lot of the handle. And so I then I just used the bankroll that I had from that play to send wires. And I would send wires to sports books constantly and I would get ten thousand on a hundred thousand or fifteen thousand on a hundred just over and over and over again. And that they would like and that they would take big bets. So it was not hard to lose a hundred somewhere and then be able to send them another wire for a hundred. Uh, I mean, I, I can wow. say I'm fairly confident. I can talk about that now because those days I think are long gone. I mean, I think there's within the last couple of months, I feel like the major operators have gotten a lot sharper and a lot tighter back in the day when they just wanted some, they basically wanted, they basically wanted handle. I think that they wanted sports to look unprofitable because that would open the door to I uh, casino, and if they had really big handle, I think they could sell it to other states. You know, saying like, "Look at this handle that you missed." But the but but the re reality is, I mean, they were giving away, you know, free bets and stuff that were just insane, and they were giving away these deposit matches, especially at the high end. That I mean, I I don't think that stuff will ever happen again. But fortunately, I had a bankroll to be able to take advantage of it. Wow. That's, that's amazing. I, I didn't realize how big it had got. I mean, how much they were actually giving away. I, I, yeah, I mean, or, in, that, in that size. Yeah. Or, like, sometimes they would be stackable. Like, I got one. It was bet, I think it was bet, uh, I think it was bet uh, 250000 in a weekend and get a $50,000 free bet. Okay, fine, but if I send you a wire for two hundred and fifty, you're going to give me a fifty thousand dollar free bet anyway, or, or sorry, not a fifty thousand dollar free bet. Like at Caesars, I was getting ten percent free bets on any wire size. 
right. So if I send you like uh, two fifty, I'm going to get a uh, twenty five. You know, and, and, and you can't do that, huh? Wait, you're you're getting twenty five on the two fifty, and then you're also getting a fifty thousand dollar free bet on top of it, right? Correct. But what I would do is I would send them a hundred because I felt like I could blow up a hundred faster than I could blow up the 250, right? Which meant I could re-up it, right? Because if I can blow it up more <laughs> often, I'll get 10 more often than get, you know, 25 ones. And then I have to wait more months to blow it up. Wow. No, it was insane. Wow. I mean, I think those first, like that first year, this first couple months were insane. And, and, I, and I mean, I don't mind talking about it now because I really think you would be hard pressed to get those kind of deals, and if you can, then great. You know, you should work your host. But I, but I mean, I think there was a period of time when those offers were very, very good. Yeah, yeah you don't have that to sounds be like it. a very, don't have to be a very good sports better to, to win when you get those kind of rebates. No, and I mean that was a situation where like I would always hedge, which I know people. We'll probably like argue about till the end of time. But in my situation there, because I was sending big wires, like I still am a little tight on cash if I'm doing this at multiple sports books, right? And so, and so the EV of preserving my bankroll growth because I'm getting, you know, a five or 10% on that every week is more valuable than taking those free bets at plus. 400 or 700 and then going over 10 and not having money to send, you know, some future. Well, wire. I mean, I think, oh, uh-uh. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you had a big bankroll, but probably not big enough to take the kind of swings that you would take if you're, you know, betting at seven to one. Uh, I mean, you can, you can dig a very, very large hole with that, uh, you know, at those uh, sizes. Yes, you're absolutely right. And so the value of reinvesting the free bet, if I hedge it, is worth way more than the added value of taking it unhedged, right? So I would always hedge yep. them. Yep. Then, in turn, what I would get yeah. is then I would have square action somewhere else, too, which also looks good, right? But I could also extract value like that. Sure. Yeah. We're going to take a brief uh, break for some commercials, and then we will be back with uh, Mr. Doppy. Tales from the Felt is a new card counting and advantage play coffee table book that takes you inside the grind. 21 stories told by 21 different APs. Adventure, intrigue, and loneliness on the path beating casinos for millions. Beautifully illustrated and bound, this collector's edition book features Hall of Famers and emerging heroes of the game. Proceeds go to help those affected by problem gambling. Learn more at store.blackjackapprenticeship.com or find a link below in the show notes. Videopoker.com is the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, eight ninety five a month or seventy nine ninety five a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the games. Game of the week is Lucky Eight. Yeah. This is a rare case where a video poker game has the same name as a table game side bet. This is a 10 coins per line game where you get bonuses for three or more eights, including full houses with three eights. You get dealt trips or higher about every 35 hands. You get to spin the wheel, which includes amounts ranging from 188 to, very occasionally, 18,800. Uses wild variations, you spin the wheel on dealt flushes or higher, which occur every 42 hands on average. You'll need to figure out the strategy for yourself, but it appears to be possible with simple algebra. With two pair 88445, for example, it must be correct just to hold the 8 because the bonus is on three or more 8s. On Deuces Wild Variations, where you would normally hold a suited Jack 10 9 over a pair of 8s, or maybe holding Jack 10 9 8, in this game, surely holding the 8 better. Everyone seems to be talking about sports betting lately. If you're looking to learn more about how you can profit from the sports betting gold rush, then unabated.com is a great resource for you. Founded by frequent gambling with an edge guests, Captain Jack and Rufus Peabody, Unabated has free educational articles and an odd screen to help you shop lines. If you bet props, their essential tier has projections and simulators you won't find anywhere else. Premium tier membership adds an array of pricing calculators, in-game tools, and the most advanced real-time odd screen available. 
take a trial run with their tools to decide if unabated.com is right for you. Okay, we are back with Mr. Doppy. Okay, so what are you doing nowadays? Still betting sports or what's happening? Yeah, I mean, that stuff has gotten very, very tight. So I think there's still some tiny little edges, but I think, like I said, I think the days for me, at least, of sending wires and getting big bonuses and getting offers uh, constantly, I think, are pretty much over. Uh, Caesars just cut my seven-star status, which I didn't think they would do because I earned it. It was verified, and then they waited a couple weeks, and they said, due to an internal business uh, choice, um, you're not seven stars anymore, which I was annoyed by because I booked my seven stars retreat and I paid for the airfare and then they refused to give me the credit on the airfare for the trip that I had booked, which I thought was kind of gross. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, that sucks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm doing some, uh, some like some of the sports stuff and a little bit of the I casino stuff and then uh, just trying to figure out what my next steps are. I, I still have a consulting job in finance. I'm a CFA charter holder, so, you know, I can get a finance job if I need it. And then just in my spare time, I'm big into uh, credit card points at Chase, too. So still grinding those as hard as I can. Oh, yeah. You mentioned that uh, you you didn't know anything about that. That was something you learned from Gambling with an Itch? Sure. I mean, that started on an episode you guys had uh, Jimmy Jazz on, and I was like, oh, this seems like something that could be good for me, uh, you know, because I was looking to get a better re- re- return on my spend, and it wasn't an area that I was really familiar with. I also thought that if I was going to try to, to n- n- network with other APs, that might be something that if I build up a lot of knowledge about that could be valuable to people. Right. And so I was like, okay, well, if I can get really good at this, then perhaps I can add value that might, you know, make people realize that I'm sharp, even though I don't have gambling information at the time, you know, because I think the things are similar. And so, yeah. And so since then, I think I've done fairly well, but I'm only a chase guy and I only use points for travel, but I average between 12 and 13 percent back on like every dollar charge every year. And that's been going on. For How do you get that high? How do you get up to 12 years. or 13 percent? So, right. So, again, I mean, I'm going to re- redeem these for travel. So this is not cash back. Right. But, but I'm redeeming for coach. Not right. For right. Basically, at Chase, the thing that really drives it is the Chase Freedom cards are now the Chase Freedom Flex cards. They're the cards that have 5 percent cash back with a 1500 max right for every quarter okay and so that yeah. might be at a grocery store that could be at a gas station okay and if if you have a freedom card and you have a premium chase card then you get a minimum of 1.5 percent back uh, i'm sorry 1.5 times the amount that you earn on the freedom if you are using it for travel so so if i have sapphire reserve and I have a Chase Freedom card, my 5% on Freedom is worth at least 7.5%, right? So yeah. the thing is, is that you have to get other Freedom cards. So you can't apply for a card that you have, but you can apply for another Chase card that's not branded. So like Freedom, un- 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 Freedom un- Unlimited, for example. And then you can wait a year and product change into a second freedom card. And now you have $3,000 a quarter at 5%. Well, I have four Chase Freedom cards now because I've done this over many years. So I have $6,000 a quarter at 5%. That 5% is seven and a half of Sapphire Reserve. I have Companion Pass. So now you're looking at about 16% based on how I value Southwest Flight. So you know, so suddenly I ha- I have I have uh, I have uh, twenty four thousand a year at sixteen percent if I travel with a companion, and, and right, so, so that stuff adds up fairly easily, and it's all just about how you get things coded. So if you live in an area with a grocery store that owns a gas station and they own a grocery store, if it's five percent at gas stations, 
buy a grocery store gift card at that gas station. It'll be coded as 5% and then spend it on your grocery. And so, so the what gas happened station is, has a gift. The gas station has a gift card for the grocery store. Yes, if it's a situation like a Kroger, a Safeway, a Giant Eagle, Albertsons, or whatever, they often sell their own uh, gift cards at the gas station, and th- and and those can be used anywhere. So by buying it at the gas station, I can get it coded as five percent, which, like I said, is effectively like sixteen for travel. And then I can use that on my spend at the grocery stores. Or some stores will permit you to buy other other gift cards with their own gift cards, which means at the end of the quarter that oh. I can just load up and use it as a store of value until I need to buy a gift card for Lowe's or Home Depot or something. So when you buy at the gas station, because that's the one I was thinking, how are you going to spend 6000 at a gas station? When you buy yeah. gift cards at the gas station, are you buying like Visa gift cards or or what what do they have? No, so say it is like a Safeway, right? If if I buy a Safeway yeah. gift card at the Safeway gas station, I can use that at the Safeway grocery store. Yeah, there's no premium for the gift card. You're you're getting full value of it. Correct. There's no premium for the card. You're getting full face value. Um, and and so Ah. then I can just use it to store the value there because if I'm able to convert a Kroger, a Safeway, or a Giant Eagle gift card into any of the other retail gift cards that they sell, then I'll just wait till I need them and they have a special on gas and I'll redeem them. Now, obviously, it is a function of, like, interest rates, right? Because, like, I have a couple million miles now. So if I'm not spending miles for years and I can get 4%, well, you know, should I really be floating those gift cards? I'm not sure. But if I don't Right, right. But if I don't have a lot of miles, it's a great return to get, you know, twelve or sixteen percent on that money in a year by floating what you need to maximize the five percent there for the quarter. Why are you choosing only to spend the money on travel or the benefits on travel. It seems like you could monetize these if you want to. Yeah, I mean, I could, and there are promotions where I could get one and a quarter cash back against my bill, but because I have status on Southwest, I have buy one, get one free flight. So it's hard to argue, and and if I only travel with my partner or with friends, it's hard to, right, like, it's hard to take the cash at a percent and a half when I could be getting, you know, a lot more than that if I redeem it for travel. I okay. can yeah. say the well, one thing I would not do is I would not turn a bunch of Visa gift cards or do anything like that if you are an Advantage player because that looks bad, I think. I think that looks like you're I'm laundering money. I would not turn right. a lot if I was also making large cash transactions and doing other things like that. Because I've had issues with banks, and I think that would just add a whole amount of complication that's not needed. So, Well, yeah. the reason it looks like you're turning cash is because you are. Yeah. Now, let's, let's change subjects a little bit. Uh, you're a pinball player. Or you started playing pinball. How important was that in your life? Uh, sure. That was really important to me as a kid. I played with my dad a lot, and that was one of the things that we always did together. And that was one of my first, like, that was one of the first, like, um, introductions to tile you and chopping lines and uh, and progressives ever. Uh, basically, there's a pinball machine called Cyclone, and at Cyclone, there's a progressive jackpot that can be won. And if you want it then you would probably have the high score of the day. And if you had the high score of the day, then you got more free games. And so as a kid, when we would be on vacation, there'd be all these arcades and they would all have Cyclone. And he, and he would send me around to find the Cyclone pinball that had the highest progressive jackpot because that would mean if we hit it, our expected value in terms of free games would be the highest and our cost or game w- 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 would be the cheapest. And so that was one of my very early childhood, like, APs. I felt like I had a job, and I would go around and check all the progressive meters on Cyclone. 
Well, uh, uh, listen, this has been great, but we are getting to the end of our show, and we want to thank Mr. Doppy for being here. Um, and uh, if, if people can find you on Twitter as Mr. Doppy, right? Yes, yes, yep, that's correct. I've been on there for a little while. It's yeah, it's just at Mr. Doppy. That's right. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Okay. Uh, All right. Sounds good. You will. Okay, so at the end of our show, we have a recommended, and uh, Bob, you don't have one this week, is that right? That is correct. Okay, but Mr. Doppy, how about you? You have a recommended for us this week? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. I would say to people that are either in Vegas or traveling to Las Vegas, I would highly recommend going to the Pinball Hall of Fame. It's not that far from the Strip. They have like two or 300 uh, pinball machines from the 50s to probably the early 2000s, and they're all in great shape. I think it's structured as a nonprofit, and it's just a really great way to go uh, spend an afternoon in Vegas if you need something to do. And they also have uh, Cyclone there, right? So if you want to check out a progressive meter uh, on a pinball machine, it's there. It's in perfect working order. Is your name at the top of the uh, high score list? No, because I think they're actually very good pinball players there. So I don't think I've ever taken uh, the, the uh, top score there. But someday I can do it. Someday. I can hope. Yeah. I was just wondering, what, what would it be worth if you did the you got the progressive at the Cyclone in the Pinball Hall of Fame? I mean, I think it would probably pay three free games. So you might make an extra 50 cents uh, versus finding one that wasn't maxed out. <laughs> But I mean, fifty cents in like fifty cents in EV in nineteen eighty seven, right? I mean, that was big money to me. <laughs> All right, my recommended this week is the last season of the show Succession, which is on HBO. Uh, if you haven't watched it and you have access to HBO, uh, that gives you access to HBO Max, and I would highly recommend that show. And this is the final season, and it's just started few weeks ago. So yeah, check it out. Succession. Very good show. Okay. We want to uh, thank Mr. Doppy for being here and for working all these years on our show notes. And thank you, Bob. And do I get to say this this week? Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day. <laughs>